Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that summer heat? It's not just the sun, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season, stoking the coals. So get ready for the season, dive into the history books with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand from Indianapolis. Homefield crafts incredibly comfortable gear designed with iconic vintage nods over 150 colleges. A library of history right on your chest. Homefield is the Indiana Jones of collegiate apparel, uncovering hidden gems from school archives. Unique mascots, logos, and even unforgettable moments frozen in time. Visit homefieldapparel.com and shop the archives. Homefield Apparel, where comfort, nostalgia, and the spirit of college football history unite. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. There are interesting stories scattered throughout NFL history, and sometimes they come from the most unique places. The 1957 Steelers finished at 6-6 and in third place in the NFL's Eastern Division, and in this episode, we will try and tell their story. Our friend Steve Massey joins us for some commentary, as we have also searched the archives to find some relevant items from historians Matthew DeBios, Aaron Harris, and Joe Ziemba as well. The story of the 57 Steelers is coming up next. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the pig pen, your portal to positive football history. And we're going to peer back in that portal today and go back into the season of 1957 and do another one of our great audio documentaries on the 1957 Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, it's not always the winning teams or even the league champions that have the fascinating elements to them. Sometimes it's the franchises further back in the pack in the standings that have some memorable moments as well. The Steelers in 1957 were only two years removed from giving up on one of the top quarterbacks in NFL history. Pittsburgh drafted a young man named Johnny Unitas in the ninth round of the NFL draft. But Johnny U was released before the 1955 season began and the Steelers' then head coach, Walt Kiesling, decided that maybe he just wasn't the right tool for them to use on offense. The team struggled offensively, which eventually led them to the firing of Walt Kiesling. Now, we have a guest today that's going to help us out here, uh, a couple of them. And first off, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Steve Massey. I wrote the book Starlet Steelers. It's the story of the 1947 Steelers team that uh, was the first to go to the postseason. 57 Steelers team. Um, it was a year of change for the Steelers, and um, there were really three component parts that uh, that kind of marked the team and uh, brought their uh, personality together. I guess you could say their persona. The first was that the Steelers hired Buddy Parker as their head coach. Uh, Parker had been the coach of the Detroit Lions, and uh, they had won back-to-back championships, and they they lost another one to the Browns. So they'd been in three NFL titles. And before the 1957 season started, uh, Buddy, as he was prone to do, became impetuous at the uh, banquet for the Lions, the preseason banquet, and he told the crowd in the room that he couldn't win with the bunch of stiffs that he had, and he walked out on them uh, with just a few weeks to go before the season. Buddy did this a lot, this kind of thing. Uh, and so Art Rooney, the Steelers' owner, the chief, snapped him up and hired him as the Steelers' coach. And it was a wise move. And um, Buddy had some really good years with the Steelers. He had a couple of bad ones. Uh, but he kind of defined that team as tough uh, and as people that you should fear and that you were going to get beat up when you played against them. Um, so the Buddy Parker era is really one of the most important four eras for coaches for the Steelers, along with the Noel era, the Cal era. 
and um, the Tomlin era. Uh, because Buddy was the guy that had uh, the most success before those teams in the 70s. Matthew DiBiase of the Package Tourist Podcast, the author of several Lords of the Gridiron books, has a bit more to add about Coach Buddy Parker as a coach of the Steelers. This is a strange thing. You know, he's not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Buddy Parker. He's the only coach who won back-to-back NFL championships in the pre-Super Bowl era who is not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And that's a question I ask in that chapter, why? Though I, I often wonder to myself, there might, I, I taught, there, there might be a potential reason if you read in the chapter, uh, again, uh, you know, here he is in Detroit, yet uh, he, had a, he was the last uh, coach out of an all white squad. And this is Detroit now with a, with a major African-American population, yet his teams were lily white. And there, he, yeah, he had a problem with African American players. I mean, I kind of discussed that, not in, in any super great depth, but he had a problem. It, it existed, and I often wonder if that might be a residual reason that prevents him from being elected in the Pro Football Hall of Fame today. Considering we're now in a PC era, I'm kind of wondering as such. You know, that's quite. Possible. I don't, I'm just spec- it's speculation, but you kind of wonder as such, but. Hey, he in the fifties, he was he was the second greatest NFL coach after Paul Brown, and the only guy ever to beat Paul Brown twice in championship game competition. Yeah, yeah. back to back years at fifty two and fifty three. I mean, hey, I mean he coached some great players there, and <laughs> and in sixty three he came so close to getting the Steelers in the NFL championship game. Oh, if they had just won that game. A game against the Giants in week 14 and 63, but... Mm. Very true, Matthew. But what could Coach and the Steelers do to remedy the situation of such poor scoring? Steve Massey, maybe you could help us out. He brought over Bobby Lane the year after the 1957 season uh, because he didn't feel like that he had a quarterback that he could rely on. In 1957, the Steelers were entering into their 25th season as an NFL franchise. And one change, besides the coach, was the wearing of the yellowish gold colored helmets with the player number adorning the side. They wore these style helmets until the early 1960s when they kept the gold color and added the Steelers logo that we know today on one side. And it wasn't the black helmets till years later. You know, even with letting Johnny Unitas go two years earlier, the Steelers stable of quarterbacks was legendary in 1957. The problem was that neither the team nor the players in question had realized their potential while wearing the black and gold. Most most Steelers fans know about the uh, Johnny Unitas uh, foible that happened when they cut him uh, early in uh, the preseason of 1955. Uh, he goes on to become one of the great quarterbacks of his era, probably the greatest. Um, and the Steelers just let him go after he was a uh, late round pick. They never even gave him a snap in preseason and rarely used him in practice. Um, but a lot of people don't know that there were three great quarterbacks after that that were on the 1957 team. Uh, and they were Earl Morrill. Uh, who was around for a long time. He's a good he's a good backup man, and he could start when you needed him. Jack Kemp, who played for the uh, Buffalo Bills and won two championships there. And Lynn Dawson, who played for those great Chiefs teams, uh, including the, when they won Super Bowl IV. Buddy started Earl Morrill, and Earl had been uh, chosen uh, as one of the top five overall picks. And Paul Brown allegedly said that he wanted Earl Morrill. Paul Brown was the coach of the Browns. Um, and he expressed disappointment that he got Milt Plum. I don't know how Milt Plum felt about that, but it couldn't have been too good. Um, and in, in Brown's defense, he did get Jimmy Brown that same draft. So uh, you can't say too many negative things about that. Morrill is a pretty good quarterback, but he's inconsistent, and Parker chooses to start him. Um, but he would have a big game uh, for the time. He would get a lot of passing yardage, usually over 200 or 250 yards. Um, he was capable of throwing two or three touchdowns in a game, uh, but he was just streaky. You never knew whether he was going to do well or not. And actually, he had a really poor game uh, after the midway point in the 57th 
season when the fans started chanting, we want Kemp. And uh, Buddy did put Kemp in. Now, Kemp was a late-round choice. He was, uh, I think, in the 16th round out of this little college called Occidental. Um, but Buddy never really gave him a chance. He had, I think, four passes in that game, and he yanked him and put Morrill in. So uh, Kemp stuck around until they cut him shortly thereafter, and they had Lynn Dawson, who was uh, a great college quarterback out of Purdue. Dawson got tired of sitting on the bench after several years, and they cut him loose, too, and the Chiefs scooped him up, and he ended up in the Hall of Fame. But he was another guy that, that Buddy never really gave a chance to. So you're looking at when those three guys, not even counting United, when those three guys were cut, they end up getting a hand in eight or nine championships over the next 12 years. And the Steelers pretty much let them all go. Um, and they just weren't used the right way. But Parker decided to start a 23-year-old Michigan State product, Earl Morrill, and only a year removed from college. Football Odyssey host Aaron Harris a couple years ago has told us all about Morrill. Earl Morrill. He had some pretty interesting superlatives for a guy that was kind of a journeyman. He was actually voted the MVP for the Dolphins when they went 17-0. and that, that, That's an impressive feat because... You know, when, when Greasy went down and he came in, you know, that's that's not a... And he came in for an extended period of time. I think he came in for like nine games, yeah, maybe even more right. than that. So, like, uh, you know, he, he definitely had to fill, fill in some pretty big shoes, but he did it. You know, he led the Colts to that 68 season that ultimately ended in massive disappointment. But, you know, they still had a stellar season that year. And, you know, he came in and relieved Johnny Unitas in the biggest game uh, in Super Bowl five and led them to a victory, so... You know, he's a guy that was definitely a journeyman, maybe didn't have you know, a stellar career, but you know, he definitely had his moments. Indeed. And perhaps these future legendary arms were not ready for the NFL spotlight yet, as their play reflected on the team and the offense and how it went. In terms of offense, the Steelers were one of the worst teams in the league. Uh, they couldn't run the ball. Uh, their passing, like I said, was streaky. You never knew whether they were going to have a great offensive game or a terrible one throwing the ball. So the offense just didn't have much at all. But he didn't have much at all to work with. It's kind of a miracle that they got to sit and sit. Yes, the Steelers would eventually, one by one, let these future legendary quarterbacks go on to play for other teams. Between them, they won nine NFL titles, but not one with the Steelers. Part of that, though, was Coach Parker bringing in the talented quarterback that he had in Detroit, Bobby Lane. The Steelers had a very interesting player with a great backstory on the offensive line as well. Frank Veracchione, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure that that's the correct <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, but the, mainly, I just wanted to say that uh, you know he played like half his career in Pittsburgh and half with the Rams. And Merlin Olson gave a great quote about him. He said that he was one of the greatest ever at getting away with holding. While their 1957 counterparts on offense were hot and cold, the defensive side of the ball was a mainstay for Pittsburgh. The 1957 Steelers defense, it was pretty much elite. Uh, they finished in the top four in every category. Now you have to, you have to rem uh, remember that there were only 12 teams then. So, uh, you know, we don't want to get carried away. There's not there's not 32 teams or anything like that, but it's still one of the uh, toughest defenses around. And um, there's a few people that are that really kind of stand out. Uh, one of them is this fellow named Bill McPeak. And um, he is one of the forgotten Steelers that was a stalwart uh, for the defense. Uh, McPeak was chosen by the Steelers late in the 49 draft uh, and the old Cleveland Browns of the rival football league, the AFC, um, also drafted him. He went with the Browns, even though he had uh, Pennsylvania roots, he went with the Browns and Paul Brown cut him uh, before the season started and the Steelers got him. And Paul Brown said that it was the biggest mistake he ever made as a coach, was letting uh, McPeak go and eventually when the Browns come into the league the NFL the next year McPeak makes a habit out of 
getting up for those Browns games. Um, he said that he really liked roughing Otto Graham up. And Otto and he were friends, but when they got on the field, that wasn't the case. Uh, the Hall of Famer Ernie Stautner uh, was in his prime in 57. He, of course, uh, becomes one of the you know, most feared men in the NFL. He had the forearm shiver that he used. He was also called a dirty ball player uh, at times in the press. Um, he uh, was an excellent pass and run defender, and he just typifies Steeler football. He's one out of three of the Steelers that have had their numbers retired. Um, that's, that's saying something. Our friend Joe Ziemba, author of multiple pro football history books, including When Football Was Football, added this little tidbit about Ernie Stautner a couple years ago in our NFL Greatest Number 70s podcast. He wasn't a very big lineman. He played at 6'1", about 230. But another interesting backstory, he was born in Germany back in 1925, I believe. He served in the also served in the Marines in World War II. And when he came out of uh, out of the war, he eventually ended up at Boston College as a teammate with Art Donovan, which I wasn't aware of, who we just talked about. But had such a successful career with the Steelers uh, as a defensive tackle that he was the very first player to have his number retired by the Steelers. And of course, went into the Hall of Fame in 1969. But at the start of the show, I, I mentioned how small a player was, and that was Ernie. And he originally went to Notre Dame where the great Frank Leahy said, I'm afraid you're too small and too slow to be a big time football player. And then he started out his pro career uh, with the Giants, didn't make the team. And Steve Owen, the coach of the Giants says, I, I just don't think you have the size, son. And then he went over to the Steelers where Walt Kiesling, who we've talked about uh, before was a coach, who simply says about Ernie, he's the greatest tackle ever to play in the National Football League. There were many more gritty players on defense too, such as Bob O'Neill and Joe Kupka, who held their own on the flanks on the ends of the defensive line. And in his secondary, they had a couple veterans too, such as Gary Glick, who led the team of willing tacklers, including a Hall of Famer. And the other one is Jack Butler, who had 10 interceptions that year. Um, which is a, it's a lot of interceptions, particularly in a 12 game season. And of course, Butler ends up as one of the great Steelers scouts. Um, and he's involved in the organization for 40, 50 years as either a scout or a player. Uh, so he had an outstanding year. Uh, the Steelers were tough. They just never could get it together on both sides of the ball. The defense went down one year later, uh, one or two years later. And the offense by that time was uh, starting to hum when Bobby Lane was brought in at quarterback, uh, replacing Earl Morrill as the starter. With all these great players, we had to go into the season and talk about that a little bit. And the Steelers, despite the little time they had with their new coach, came out of the gates swinging in the 1957 season with a big victory over Washington by the score 28 to 7. That was September 29th. Remember, Buddy Parker did not come in until August 27th as a coach, so a, a month and two days, and they had a big victory over Washington. Earl Morrill threw three touchdown passes in that game, and Dick Young added another score via the run. The defense only allowed 242 yards and recovered two fumbles against Washington on that day. In week two, they lost a tight one to the Cleveland Browns 23-12. The Steelers either won or were in a competitive battle each week of that 1957 season except for week four which was a 35 to nothing blanking by the New York Giants and a one-sided late season second loss to Jim Brown and those Cleveland Browns. Now we have a game-by-game -game, uh, description, uh, at least the box score, on every single game of the 1957 season on pigskindispatch.com. Follow the links to the show notes. And 1957 was indeed a wild and unsettling season for the Pittsburgh Steelers as they went through that late coaching change. May have had too many good quarterbacks who were not quite ripe enough and had an easy fan base that was looking for a title run. Well, they would have to wait a little over 15 more years for that to happen. But just goes to show, even in mediocrity with a 6-6 six six, uh, season record, 
the Steelers still had some great players, including a couple of Hall of Famers on the roster. An interesting story, and uh, you know, a stable of quarterbacks that uh, went on to do some great things. And we didn't even mention Ted Marchabrota, who was coming up through the ranks as well at that time. So maybe you could throw a fifth arm in that uh, for good quarterbacks that were coming through. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this little segment as we look back at football history and some Steelers history, 1957, uh, before they were good. And that uh, just tells you a little bit more about football history in the era and some of these great players. And we really want to thank our guests that uh, came on today. Steve Massey did a lot of research and work on us. We appreciate Steve for coming on and sharing with us. And also the voices of Joe Ziemba, Matthew Debios, and Aaron Harris as they uh, shared some of their great knowledge and wisdom from past archived uh, podcasts. They weren't really talking about the 57 Steelers, but they were talking about some players on that team, and we were glad that we were able to use their archive knowledge to help us today in this look at 1957 Steelers. So thank you very much for joining us. Hope you'll join us next time for some more great football history. And until next time, everybody, have a great, great Iron Day. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.